So I want to move now into a discussion of Schelling's book, uh, The First Outline of a System of the Philosophy of Nature, uh, which was published in 1799, about five years after Fichte's book on uh, the science of knowledge. And Schelling um, <clears throat> really was began as a kind of uh, Fichtean. He was uh, very much under the influence of Fichte. Uh, and his early papers read as various restatements of Fichte's ideas. Uh, but the one thing that develops in Schelling um, that we don't find in Fichte is regard for nature. Uh, and so what Schelling does is he applies Fichte's principles of the genesis of the self and the not self and, and, and the kind of dynamics, uh, the kind of language that Fichte uses to nature in general so that nature becomes a kind of absolute subject that's a, a sort of macrocosmic counterpart to Fichte's microcosmic uh, self. Um, and so in this respect, we see then that uh, Schelling takes the same principles and applies them to the cosmos so that we get this cosmos as an absolute subject uh, that unfolds from out of itself in direct analogy to the way that Fichte post postulates the self uh, and its production of the not self as an inhibiting obstacle to its infinite striving. Uh, so, too, as we'll see with Schelling, nature is doing something very similar. Um, so. Um, Schelling was part of the whole circle along with Hegel and, and uh, Fichte and Halderlin. Um, all these guys were part of the same general development at this time that was going on in Germany. Uh, and Schelling starts off more or less under the influence of Fichte, and it takes him a while, not until about 1800, 1801 or 2 or 3, 4, right in there, that he starts to come out from underneath Fichte's shadow. So this book is still written under the shadow of Fichte, and Hegel at this time is also under the influence of Schelling, and he won't break away from that until he puts out uh, the phenomenology of, of the spirit in 1808. So it takes him a while to break away. In a certain sense, we could say that if Fichte is the thesis here, Schelling is the antithesis, and Hegel is the synthesis of both Fichte and Schelling. This is why I don't believe that you can properly understand he Hegel and what's going on in Hegel without understanding his intellectual background and the influence upon him of the philosophies of both Fichte and Schelling. They're absolutely essential. Uh, they're a little red nowadays, Fichte and Schelling. Everybody reads Hegel. But if everybody's reading Hegel without having read or understood Kant, Fichte, Schelling, they're only getting a certain part of Hegel. They're not getting the full picture. Because uh, there are all sorts of dimensions that will remain enigmatic and inaccessible in Hegel without a knowledge of these prior three philosophers. Each of these German philosophers uh, builds on and presupposes the one that comes before and builds on and amplifies him. So if Fichte is the thesis uh, of the subject as the absolute self, then Schelling becomes the antithesis of nature. Nature for Fichte is his Achilles heel. It's something for him that he largely dismisses with the term not self. Nature is simply everything that is not self. And so it's a very poorly developed idea that he has. For him, nature is merely an obstacle that the self postulates uh, in the way of its moral activity for, for it to overcome. Uh, and Schelling didn't see it that way at all. Schelling had much more of a kind of German romantic, and I think with Schelling we're starting to move more out of the Enlightenment and into the Romantic movement itself proper. Schelling had a, a, a much more mystical conception of nature, a much greater respect for it, I think, than Fichte did, as we can see here. And for him, nature um, was what it was all about. And so what uh, if we look at the first chapter then of the first outline of the system of the philosophy of nature, it opens up with a discussion. Uh, it's divided into a series of divisions. So we have the first division, and the first part is the book's introduction after an initial outline of the book as a whole, uh, called The Unconditioned in Nature. And so this is the first thing that he starts with. He says that um, with regard to philosophy, uh, the subject uh, that will become the object for philosophy, or the object of philosophy, will become as its subject, the unconditioned. That's its, that's its proper subject, the unconditioned. So to what degree unconditionedness can be found in nature then becomes the question that we want an answer to. To what degree can we find unconditioned, the unconditioned in nature? What is the unconditioned? And of course, the unconditioned is, um, for showing the absolute, it is the absolute spirit in, in its larger macrocosmic sense. Whereas for Fichte, the absolute had been the self. The absolute was the self in itself as its originary transcendental starting first principle. For Kant, uh, the unconditioned was something that reason went in search of. Reason always 
uh, went in search of the unconditioned as whatever ultimate unifying factor it may be, God, freedom, immortality, that gave synthetic unity to one's cosmos. And so reason always goes in quest of the unconditioned. But for Schelling now, the unconditioned becomes the absolute spirit. And he says that the first principle that he starts with now uh, in his philosophy of nature is that the unconditioned is the principle of nature's highest activity. It is the, the actual principle. Actually, there's some interesting light that this passage uh, sheds on Heidegger's later discussions of being, and one wonders if Heidegger had read this text because Schelling starts off by saying that the unconditioned uh, is not ever evident in this or that particular being of nature. Uh, it is rather the principle of being itself, um, by which we cannot say that it is. It, it never is in any particular thing. It is being itself because it makes everything else in nature, all of its productions, possible. And it does this through the principle of the construction of uh, and the building of its forms. It is the absolute activity of nature. So the unconditioned is absolute activity, not empirical activity. It isn't for showing this kind of activity uh, is absolute, and it isn't evident in any particular one of the forms of nature. Although he does say that um, the next principle is that in each of the forms of nature, each product of nature bears the infinite, bears the infinite and the tendency toward in, infinite becoming within it as part of its very nature. And that the sum total of this constant infinite becoming and striving in all of the forms of nature adds up to the absolute activity of nature as an absolute whole. And so what it will turn out to be the case, or what will turn out to be the case for Schelling is that the absolute spirit unfolds itself through nature. It self-objectifies. And here we can already see language that later becomes similar for Hegel. It self-objectifies as nature. And in doing so, it eventually builds nature in a way that goes through a series of processes of what, what he calls potencies, which is a series of levels of nature, each one getting more complex than the one before it, until it ends with the production of the human subjectivity as its highest expression, whereby in and through human subjectivity, the absolute spirit becomes conscious of itself. Uh, and so the human is its ultimate instrument for, for attaining to self-conscious awareness. Uh, but it takes it a long time, and it has to go through a lot of stages to get to that point, to build up to it. And ultimately what he will say, he doesn't say it yet in the introduction, but what he will say is that there are three potencies in nature, or three fundamental levels in uh, what he says in this opening is that um, one of the fundamental aspects of this absolute activity of nature is that it has an originary polarity to it. There's a fundamental duality about it that is originary, that is a priori, that is prior to the production of all of nature's forms. And in this respect, I think we can see the influence of Goethe upon Schelling. And to a certain degree, to a very large degree, I think Schelling's vision of nature is a synthesis of Goethean science with Fichte. Uh, for Goethe, uh, everything in nature was based on polarities. His color theory was based upon the polar opposition of light and darkness. All the other colors he saw as being produced by uh, the inner operation of light and darkness in differing degrees and shades. Uh, his plant, his theory of plant metamorphosis was based on the basic primal polarity, the ur phenomenon of the tension between uh, spiral growth of the plant and its vertical tendency to rise straight up. Uh, and so everything for Goethe was based on this polarization as it is for Schelling. Uh, and then he, so what he says is that the way in which nature works is that it has this infinite striving, this infinite activity. Note the correlations with Fichte. Na the infinite striving of, in, of nature in its unconditioned absolute activity corresponds precisely to Fichte's depiction of the self as in a mode of striving toward the infinite. The self strives toward the infinite. What happens to the self in Fichte? It posits the non-self, which becomes an inhibitory check on its energies. And the not-self, in checking its energies, ends up generating the external world. Same thing here for nature. What the absolute spirit does is it has this infinite tendency to pour forth its energy, to constantly become, to strive. Formation, transformation, as Goethe put it, the eternal mind's eternal recreation. Pun on recreation and recreation. Um, and so what happens is that um, there has to be a fundamental inhib inhibition, Schelling says. There has to be a series of points of inhibitions that check this infinite force to pour forth inexhaustibly. 
And these points of inhibitions are inhibitory forces that check and resist it, exactly like Fichte's postulation of his not-self that checks the infinite striving of the self, that resist it and uh, step it down, step its energies down, as it were, so that they become uh, able to produce uh, the polar oppositions of these energies are able then to produce the forms of nature. And the first example that he gives is that there's an infinite uh, repulsive force that matter has it to uh, repel, to fill the space that it occupies infinitely, but it's counterchecked by an attractive force, the gravitational attractive force that checks it, counterchecks it, and the opposition between the, the force of attraction and the force of repulsion brings the first level of nature, the first potency into being as mass, pure matter. And that's how it comes into being. And he draws the analogy of this. This is imagine a stream flowing along. And when the stream encounters an inhibition, rocks underneath it, it forms a whirlpool. In other words, uh, morphogenesis is not a term yet that is being used here, but it's, he means it. Morphogenesis is a production of this infinite flow of energy that encounters inhibitory forces and obstacles and at those points of inhibition, forms are produced. The whirlpool that's produced uh, when the stream encounters the rocks, it produces a form that is in a constant state of becoming. And so for uh, shelling, everything in nature is in a constant state of becoming as the result of this infinite activity of nature encountering these obstacles, these points of inhibition. The next level, the next potency of nature will turn out to be uh, the realm of what he calls dynamic processes. Uh, this is the realm of the same forces of attraction and repulsion are taken up. So that was the thesis, uh, the, the production of these two forces producing matter. The antithesis is the next level of nature, which is the dynamic level that is produced through the same forces, but which now then produce the dynamic forces of light, magnetism, electricity, chemistry. Those forces constitute nature's second potency. Uh, and then the third potency is the level of organic life, living forms, which is the synthesis of the first two. So once again, we have thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is basic constitutive structure of German thinking at this time. And uh, these, the same forces of attraction and repulsion are taken up at a higher level. And we have nature produced in so far as it produces the organic realm of living things. We'll get to that later. But this is how uh, the absolute spirit pours itself forth and objectifies itself by producing nature which is a macrocosmic analog for Fichte's self. Now you can see why we read Fichte. Even though he seemed a bit tedious, you can see why we read him, because without him, you can't fully understand what Schelling is doing, and without those two, you're not going to fully understand where Hegel is coming from. That's why it's important to read these guys and to read them in chronological sequence so you can see how they develop out of each other. So uh, he ends this introduction by saying that... Um, this, the tendency of each of nature's products has this infinite striving. Uh, the finite, the infinite is nowhere found in and of itself. It's always found in finite form in nature. And each of its products are like little mirrors that mirror the infinite totality, like Leibnizian monads that mirror the infinite totality of the absolute spirit. The absolute is found in each one of nature's forms, uh, in miniature as it were. And so uh, that's the, his disposition on the unconditioned in nature um, for the first part. And next we'll move into his theory then about how all of this begins with his theory of what he calls dynamic atomism or the originary uh, qualities or actants that begin to bring matter into being at its first potency, the first level. Um, that'll be next.